You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We've been in a series in the book of Ecclesiastes, and the title of the series is Grasping for Meaning. And today will be the last day that we hear from Koheleth. It's going to be the last thing that he says to us, and I think what he's going to say to us is going to be um, really, really important for um, our lives. Um, If this year has taught us anything... It has taught us that we can't be sure about anything. You can't be sure about what's around the corner. Because life just does not work out the way that you want it to. I was supposed to go on a cruise the beginning of 2022, and now that's not happening. I was supposed to be in Disneyland last week. That didn't happen. I ordered gifts in enough time for them to get here before Christmas, yet I still had to give people presents with pictures in it and said, you will receive this in five to seven business days. <laughs> because it's just the way life is. It doesn't always go the way that you think it should go. I think Forrest Gump was right. Life really is like a box of chocolates, and you never know what you're going to get. Even though today you can go to Seize candy and customize what you want. Let me get some of them scotch mellows. Let me get some of them with the cherry. I like the peanut brittle. And you can customize what, but you can't do that in life. You can't tell life, hey, I would like you to send me some joy and some peace and some happiness. Life's like, nah, I'm going to give you what I want to give you. So we've all realized this is part of what it looks like to live in the world that we live in, and this is what the teacher, the preacher, has been trying to help us to see, is that we live in a world of uncertainty. In fact, the point he's going to make this morning is the certainty of uncertainty. In other words, you can only be certain about this, that you can't be certain about anything. And if we live in that kind of world where you cannot be sure about what's coming around the corner, then what in the world are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to live? Remember, Ecclesiastes is in wisdom literature. And wisdom is all about trying to help you live life. It's about a skill for living. How do you live life well? And this is what the book of Ecclesiastes has been helping us to see. How do we live life in a world where it's very uncertain What's going to happen from one day to the next? How do we walk wisely? So how do you live in a world where you're not sure what's going to happen the next day? How do you live in a world where you can't be certain about anything? Koheleth is going to say three things to us this morning. Risk, rejoice, and remember. Risk, rejoice, remember. We'll look at those three, and then we'll go play with the toys we got for Christmas. All right? So let's look at... Ecclesiastes chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. I love you too, baby. She just texted me and said, I love, I see you. Um. (laughs) She said, you're looking real good too. I know. Thank you. (laughs) Can I get some water too? Where are you going? Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 1. Ship your grain across the sea. After many days, you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south Or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind, or how the body is formed in the mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let your hands not be idle. 
For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. We'll stop there for a moment. And again, he's talking about the certainty of uncertainty. And so if we live in a world where we're not certain about anything, what do we need to do? The first thing he says in these first six verses is that we need to risk wisely. Risk wisely. God has given each of us resources. So what are you supposed to do with those resources? Verse 1 says, ship your grain across the sea. In more literal translations, it will say, cast your bread upon the waters. We're like, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to ship your grain or to cast your bread upon the waters? It simply means, this is uh, talking about engaging in trade, in commerce, in overseas trading in order to uh, make your life better when it comes to money and, and possessions. And so he's saying, one of the things you need to do is, is invest the money that God or resources that God has given to you. But did you notice what he said about the way that you invest these resources? Look at it again in verse 2. He says, invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If you notice in these first six verses, over and over, he kept saying this, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. Why? Because you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. So what should you do with your resources? He says you need to invest them wisely. If you are giving out your money to something How should you do it? Here he says, invest in seven or eight ventures. Don't put all of your resources into just one thing. Why? Because you don't know what's going to happen. If you put all of your merchandise into one ship and Captain Jack Sparrow comes and takes it over, what are you supposed to do? Nothing. It's all gone. But if you put it in seven or eight ships, if one goes down, you still have the other ships. If you've taken any financial class, you've heard this. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify. Why? Because you just don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. Solomon knew this well. In 1 Kings chapter 10, and verse 22, it says, The king had a fleet of trading ships at sea along with the ships of Haram. Once every three years it returned carrying gold, silver, ivory, and apes and baboons. So he was very much acquainted with trading overseas. So he says, I want you to take what, I've, what you've received from God and I want you to do it wisely. Do not put all your eggs in one basket. I heard of a, uh, a man was talking to his pastor and he was telling him how in 2008, when we had the market crash, he lost 80% of his income. He was retired. He lost 80% of his income. And the reason why he lost that much is because he had 80% of his income in bank stock. And his financial advisor told him, you need to get that money out of that bank stock. You have too much money there. His friends told him, you have too much money in that bank stock. He said himself, I have too much money in that bank stock. He didn't do anything, and what happened? The market crashed. He lost everything. This is the principle of don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you're going to invest, do it wisely. Spread it out. Give it to multiple things. But don't just do it wisely. Also, invest your resources promptly. Look again, verse 3. It says, if clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. This is just another way of the teacher saying that it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about life. That when the rain comes or the clouds form or when a tree falls to the north or to the south, there is nothing that you can do about it. It's going to be where it's going to be. And so because of that, you need to invest what you have wisely, but you also need to do it promptly. Because one of the things people do is they say, well, <clears throat> if this is happening, if it's going to storm, if it's going to rain, if it's going to flood, then I'm not going to do anything. Verse 4, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. 
There are some people who, instead of investing what they have wisely, they say, I'm not going to do anything until it has the perfect conditions, until everything is the way it's supposed to be. And once everything is the way it's supposed to be, then I'll do something. This is not the way the preacher is saying that's how you need to use your resources. He says you need to do it wisely, but you also need to do it promptly because you really have no idea what's going to happen from one day to the next. And so you just need to be proactive and do something because if you don't do anything, you don't reap. If a farmer doesn't plant, he doesn't reap anything. And so just by saying, well, I'm just going to wait until something happens, you end up having nothing. Don't be so afraid to risk. You remember the parable that Jesus told about the five talents? The one servant he gave five. In fact, the new NIV says bags of gold. That kind of threw me off. He said one had five bags of gold, and he, he left, and when he came back, he earned five more. The other one, he gave two bags of gold. When he came back, he earned two more. The other guy, he gave one, and, and, and Matthew says he gave it according to their ability. So they're like, let's see, I know you're able to manage this, manage, manage this. And he gave that one guy, that one bag of gold, and you know what he said? He said, I know you're a crazy person, and I don't want to lose your money, so I put it in the ground. Here it is, right back. You know, remember what he said to him? You wicked, lazy servant. You should have at least put it in the bank so I can gain some interest. And they took it, and he gave it to the one who had 10. In other words, he's saying, don't just take what I've given you and bury it and hide it. Use it wisely. Don't say, well, I don't know what to do with it. People are averse to stepping out and just doing something because they always want the perfect conditions. You don't, need, don't be afraid to risk things. Amen. When I was uh, small, our dad took us to Reno every year for vacation, and we'd go to Circus Circus, and he'd always give us money, all of our siblings money. And he'd give me money, Josh money, Shantae money, and we would go out and play in Circus Circus. And inevitably, Josh would always be the first one to lose all of his money. <laughs> the reason is because the way his personality is, he's like, I'm going for the biggest prize. I'm going for the most expensive game. So he would take the games that cost the most and have the biggest prize. And the thing is, he won a lot of those prizes. We had to try to figure out how to fit these big old uh, uh, stuffed animals into the car. Now they're in our house, these big old like stuffed animal guardians in our house now. And he had, but the way he did it, he said, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and win and I'm going to, it's going to cost me a dollar each game, but I'm going to do it. But it meant that he ended up losing his money very, very fast. Me, on the other hand, I came back with money. They would give me money, like they would give me $20, I'd come back to the room with 15 Say, said, what would you do? I was like, ah, I looked at that game, and I said, that looks rigged. Uh, I'm not very good at that game. Uh, that looks like I can't, and, and I would not play the games. And he would give me more money, and I would just stack up. I would leave from Reno rich. But what would happen is, I didn't win anything. Josh had all the prizes, and I just had nothing, money. Because I wasn't willing to risk. I just wanted to hold, and that's my personality. My dad and my sister, my brother, they're, they're not like me. They will jump out there and risk it all. All right? I wouldn't be here if my father did not risk. He said to a lady, I think you're beautiful. I think you're awesome. I think I want to marry you. She said, that's nice. <laughs> that's nice. But he risked it. Standing back and waiting for per perfect conditions is not the way that God has called us to live in a world full of uncertainty. Will things bad happen? Probably, yes. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. Amen. I listened to a YouTuber talk about how Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey is a financial guru who, if you listen to he has great advice about getting out of debt and things like that, but he was about 26, 27. He had just gotten out of, out of a lot of debt. And his friends said, hey, they're selling these homes, and you can get into it. And he was kind of like, ah, I don't know. Dave Ramsey said that you shouldn't buy a home unless you can put 20% down and do a 15-year loan. Don't do it. And he's like, well, I have enough for 3%. But, I said, but Dave, Ramsey said, Dave Ramsey said, don't do it. So he didn't. His other friends did it. Well, fast forward to today. That home that he would have bought today was worth somewhere around $800,000. And he said, he cost me half a million dollars. Now, I'm not here to say whether or not that's good advice or not, but I'm just saying that he was so 
afraid of what might happen that he wasn't willing to risk. And some of his other friends who bought homes, now they have those homes and they've doubled in value. The idea here of what Koalith is saying is if you are going to use the resources that God has given you, you need to do it wisely. You need to do it promptly because that's the way God would have us to do it. So in verse 6 he says, And sow your seed in the morning, and at evening your hands... Don't let your hands be idle, for you do not know what will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. So the, the idea is you just don't know. Here's, here's something that I want us to hear. Christians, we are so addicted to success. And we live in a world that says you will not always be successful. Sometimes, people, sometimes Christians are weird. Like, if God's with you, it's going to succeed. No. You might have a business. Doesn't work out. Just because you're saved doesn't mean everything's going to work out. Because we live in a world where we don't know what's going to happen. You might invest in something and it might flop. The reason why I'm so nervous is because over the years people say, you should invest in this stock. Okay. And then come to find out it was a scam or it didn't really work out well. So I'm just very nervous about that. But he says here, you need to work, you need to sow, and just expect you don't know what's going to happen. And as Christians, we need to stop being so addicted to success because God has not called you to be successful. He's called you to be faithful. And as long as you're worrying about, well, if, if I can't really know that I'm going to be successful, I'm not going to do it. Stop being so concerned with success. You can't win them all. You can't go 16 and 0. You can't go 162 and 0. You can't go 82 and 0. You can't do it. We're not perfect. We have problems. We have issues. Charlena said it this morning, evangelism. That's one area that we just, we're just so convinced that the only way people are going to be saved if I say the right words at the right time, in the right sequence, and then people will get saved. Can I just tell you something? Listen to me. Most of the people you talk to about the faith are not going to believe. Most of them. You will fail when it comes to sharing your faith more often than not. People say, well, I don't want to say the wrong thing, and I, I don't know all the scriptures, and I, just, I can't talk like this person. Listen, even if you said it perfectly, you get it all right, all the words, that person will still look at you and say, ah, no thanks. Can I tell you how many times I've been on this stage and have given an invitation and felt the Holy Spirit and almost said, I need to get saved myself. <laughs> That's how strong I felt about my invitation. And the the same people, I I know you ain't saved. I I know you ain't saved. (laughs) And I'm looking at them, and they're looking at me, and I'm just like, come on, it's time to come to the Lord. I I can see the Holy Spirit, like, pushing them up to the front. And they just sitting there looking at me, hmm, that's nice. That's nice. Do you think you getting the words right, getting the scripture right is what's going to save people? Some of the most illiterate people have been the best evangelists. Stop worrying about being successful. Let me tell you something. 2022, expect to fail. Go out there and say, I'm going to tell you the gospel. You probably won't believe, but who knows? Who knows? We need to be able to risk for the gospel. What are we doing to sow seeds of the gospel throughout the world? And stop where, well, I don't, when we went out to go witness, remember we went to Target? Handed out tracks, put tracks on the, on the cars. How many people came to faith through that? Most people were trying to fight us. Get away from me. I don't want to hear that. You guys remember what my dad said? He was in Canada going out to witness, opened the, uh, knocked on the door, said, I want to hear to tell you about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the guy said, if I had a gun, I'd shoot you. That's, that's what you should expect. When somebody says, yes, I believe, you should be like, huh? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because we live in a world of uncertainty, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't sow. 
It doesn't mean we should not put it out there because we don't know what God's going to do. I can tell you so many stories of people going door to door in another country. They were going door to door, witnessing, and people were seemingly believing. Some people said the prayer, some people didn't. And then years and years later, they were in this country and they were taking pictures. They asked this guy to take a picture of them. So the guy grabbed the camera, took the picture, and they said, I don't think you remember me, but about four years ago, you guys came by, and you knocked on my door, and you told me the gospel, and I said the prayer only because my mom was there. I wanted her to, like, you know, be proud of me, whatever. But after that, I didn't really walk in it. I went to depression, almost killed myself. But then, a couple years later, I was sitting there, and I remembered those words that you said to me, and I received the Lord, and I'm a Christian today because of what you did. So can I just tell you, can I just tell you, let's sow seeds. Let's risk for the gospel. Let's stop being so afraid to step out and say something about the Lord. So uh, the second part is we need to rejoice greatly. Look at verse 7. He says, light is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all. But let them remember the days of darkness there will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. You who are young, be happy while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever you see, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body for youth and vigor are meaningless. So he now says, not just risk, but also rejoice. This is the sixth time that Koheleth has talked about enjoying life. Now, we, those of you who have been here during the series, we've been saying, enjoy life, enjoy food, enjoy drink, enjoy your wife, enjoy your work. It's going in and out. Enjoy everything that God has given to you, to the glory of God. Enjoy it. So the Christian life isn't, oh, we just got to be sad. When you come to our church, we joke, we laugh, we have a good time. You ever hang around us? Got a lot of crazy people in this church. <laughs> because we love life, we enjoy life, we enjoy food. We enjoy games because that's what God wants us to do. Enjoy it. But he says to the young, he says, listen, young. And if you are young, listen to me. Some of you are like, I'm young. <laughs> if you are young, listen to me. He says, enjoy God while you're young. He's going he's gonna to address it even more deeply in a second. But his point here is rejoice. This is the sixth time. First Timothy chapter 6. Remember what Paul said. He said, command those who are rich in this present world not only to, not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. God has given everything that we have for our enjoyment. But here is what the teacher has been trying to help us to see. That... These things that we are enjoying, we don't find ultimate satisfaction in those things. Those, those things that we are looking at as giving us joy and, and, and life, those things are not meant to give us an ultimate satisfaction because that place is only for God. We learned that in chapter 3, that God, there's this um, God-shaped hole in the heart of every person that can only be filled by God. So if you're looking to your wife to complete you, sorry, Jerry. Is it Jerry Maguire who said that? You complete me? That's crazy. No other human being can complete you. Some people say, you subtract from me. <laughs> people are not meant to complete you. Only God can complete you. Your food is not going to complete you. Though if I just got this food, I'd be so happy. I ate a bunch of food yesterday, and I was sick after. 
because it was it was so good. It was, but it's like there's so much sweetness in my mouth. It's just crazy. At some point, you say this doesn't satisfy. Work doesn't satisfy. Nothing satisfies us. The only thing that can satisfy us is God himself. So he says, I want you to enjoy that which I've given to you. Christians are not opposed to that. But here's where he says, I want you to enjoy responsibly. Look at it again. He says, you who are young, verse 9, be happy while you are young. If you're young, be happy. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart, whatever your eyes see. He's saying when you're young, you have the world in front of you. You have so much that you can do and be a part of. Have fun. God is giving you this world. However, do it responsibly. You know why he, why he says that? He says because you know God will bring you into judgment. In other words, you are to enjoy what God has given to you, but you aren't to enjoy it to the point where you sin. So there are things that God has given to us to enjoy, but we can enjoy them in a way that are actually sin. And so he says, verse 10, uh, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles from your body for youth and vigor are meaningless. That word there for anxiety means vexation or frustration. When you're young, you have so... Like, I remember before I had a wife and before, before I had kids, and don't hear this the wrong way. I'm not going to... It's going to sound wrong when I say this, okay? <laughs> but before I had a wife and kids, I was so happy. <laughs> I know it sounds wrong. That's not what I mean. Don't, it's not what I mean, honey. I don't mean that, okay? What I mean is I had so much time to myself I had so much more money. You go to McDonald's with a family now? I was like, this is ridiculous. Go on a plane with kids? It's like you just have children and, and white, all that it makes it worse. <laughs> but in your youth, you have no cares. You don't have a mortgage. You don't have rent. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> But as you age, as you get older, more responsibilities, more things. He's just saying, hey, if you are young, you need to enjoy your life, but do it responsibly. Because something that the older people will tell you is that the things that you do when you are young, they can haunt you when you get old. So this is what he's saying. He's saying here, hey, listen, have fun, but just remember, God's going to call you into judgment. So you just can't be wilding out out there just doing whatever you want to do. Do it responsibly. Do it as someone who knows God. So risk, rejoice, and now he's going to say remember humbly. Remember humbly. Verse 1 of chapter 12 says, Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why did I say remember humbly? Well, what is he first? What do you mean by Remember. If you think remember means, hey, there's a, there is a God up there. There's a creator. Like, I know he exists. That's not what he means by remember. Remember means to put God on the front burner of your mind with intent to obey him. Remembering God listen, if you are young, he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. The reason why you need to remember him is because you, he is your creator. And one of the things that happens as human beings, we get very prideful and we think we brought ourselves into the world. Everything we had is from my own hard work. And he says, just remember, you are a created being. You have a creator. And because you have a creator, you need to humble yourself and you need to remember him while you are young. Because old age is coming. You see what he says there? Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the years approach where you will say, I find no pleasure in them. If you are young, listen to me. Enjoy your life. 
enjoy, <laughs> enjoy your ability to not be injured constantly. <laughs> Remember before the days of darkness and trouble come. Here's what he's going to say is that right now, if you're young, you have so much ahead of you, but there is a time coming where you will begin to age. And as he goes into uh, verse 2, he's going to give what is one of the most, if it is the most beautiful poem in the Bible about aging. And in this poem about aging, he's going to talk about in this really beautiful way what it looks like and what starts to happen when you age. Look at verse 2 of chapter 12. He says, <clears throat> Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark. He uses these pictures as a way to talk about you beginning to lose light. Now back in uh, chapter 11 where he said light is sweet. Light is a picture of life. And life is sweet. Sweet like honey. When Isn't it great to just live? To be alive? And to enjoy the things God is giving? He said, well, there's coming a time where that light will begin to diminish. He says, <clears throat> before the light and the moon, uh, the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. He says, there's going to come a time when it just rained and now here come clouds. And then it rains. And then there's clouds again. There's going to be a time when it just seems like one thing after another. One thing after another. I just got over that. Here comes something else. Verse 3. When the keepers of the house tremble. What's that? The hands begin to shake. And the strong men stoop. What is a strong man? The legs and the back begin to bend. When the grinders cease because they are few. Back in that day, they didn't have a good dentistry. And as you get older, those teeth start to come out and there's less grinders. But he's saying it in like a, such a beautiful, poetic way. Uh, he says, and those looking through the windows grow dim. Just start to lose your eyesight. <laughs> My mom yesterday for Christmas bought me glasses. <laughs> I opened the, the present, I laughed so hard. Because they always make fun of me because they show me something. I'm always like, and it's not always because I can't see. It's just like, I just do that. And maybe I'm doing it sub subconsciously, I don't know. But she brought me these glasses, and I put them on, and it, it hurt to look far away. But close, I was like, oh, I can get into this. I can do this. Not, not yet. I don't want to do that yet. Some of you are already blind. You've been blind since a young, young age. Uh, verse 4, when the doors to the street are closed, and the sound of grinding fades. You start talking about you start losing your hearing. Huh? And the sound, and when people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. You know what he's talking about there? You, you can't really hear, but the, so, the, the smallest sound of a bird wakes you up. So you can't hear, but the smallest little tweet wakes you up in the morning. You can't get it out of your head. Verse 5, when people are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets, you know, they said, the diff how do you know you're old? They said, if a young person falls down and everybody laughs, you're young. If, a, if you fall down and everybody panics, <laughs> then you're old. And the older you get, it's a lot more serious to fall than when you're young. And there are a lot more, you're just fearful of more dangers. Like everything is a problem. Everything is an obstacle. And then it says, when the almond tree blossoms. In that time of year, if you see the almond tree blossoms, they're white. He's talking about having your gray hair. And the grasshopper dragged itself along. When you were young, you hopping everywhere. 
jump, 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 jump. You get old, you just drag. Another way you could understand this is the grasshopper is heavy, which means that even a grasshopper for someone who's aging becomes something that's really hard to pick up. Your strength starts to go, which I've seen here at this church as we had a um, V, we call them VBC movers. We would help people move. <laughs> move their homes, and the number, <laughs> the men would help. It was, there was a gang of us, and as time went on, that number began to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. People would call it, <laughs> I need to move my house. People would be, ah, I'm having surgery. Everybody is so hurt and injured. <laughs> it just happens, right? And desire is no longer stirred. That's the last thing. That's Solomon for you. He said, that's the last thing I'm going to say. Desire is no longer stirred. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. So it's this steady decline. It's a picture of a house (laughs) that's falling apart. But he says it in a way to say, Even though it's falling apart, there's still something beautiful about aging. There's something about aging that God, he, in the scriptures, gives dignity to those who are older. Look at it again. He says, verse 6, remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well. Speaking of water being life and now the thing you use to get Life is now broken and has cracks in it. Verse 7, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So at the end of everything, we go back to dust. Remember, Ecclesiastes keeps sort of looking back to Genesis. Echoes of Eden, we've been hearing in, in this book. And he says, at the end, we all go back to dust. It reminds us of what God said to Adam and Eve. Dust you are and to dust you will return. This is the end of everyone. This is what the teacher has been trying to say to us this entire book, that everything is meaningless because at the end, you die. And so what is worth, what is worth anything in this life if in the end you just lose it all? And so he says to you who are young, remember your creator in the days of your youth before The night comes. Day is here, but the night is coming. One person said, (laughs) the trouble with youth is that it is wasted on the young. (laughs) Isn't it true? (laughs) Can you imagine if you had (laughs) your, your mind now as an older man older woman, and the body of you when you were younger. Look out, world. But it doesn't work like that. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. The, the, the way aging happens is we get that wisdom last. <laughs> and again, he is not saying to old people that they are useless. I can show you so many, <laughs> so many places in the Bible where... He gives dignity to those who are old. But he's saying to you who are young, do, listen to me, do not waste your life. John Piper talks about his dad who would go out and preach, and he talked about this one situation where this church had been praying for this man. He was very, very hard, very, very resistant to the gospel. And his dad came in to preach, and for whatever reason, he came in that night. And during the hymn, he came up to the front, took that preacher's hand. They sat down in the front. He shared the gospel with him. And that night, he came to faith. He believed in the Lord Jesus, and he just began to sob and sob and sob. He said, what is wrong? And he said, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. You know what he said he had wasted? His life. He said, I could have been using all these years to serve the Lord. I've wasted it. Listen to an older man who says, oh, if I could just be 30, 40, 50 again. 
and now I'm at the end of my life, and I've just now found this Savior. Now what am I going to do? Now listen, in your old age, God can still use you. Jesus only did ministry for three years. So you don't need to be concerned that coming to faith at an older age means that you can't be useful. But, it, man, when I came to faith, the, 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 the things that I've been able to do in my life because of what I did when I was young, preaching and teaching and doing all that, versus someone who comes to the ministry when they're 50 or 60. There's just something about youth and using that time that God has given you. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Because you will be old one day. And the sins of your youth will haunt you in the future. Um, Charles Spurgeon said, youthful sins lay a foundation for aged sorrows. So if you're young here, don't think that what you're doing now will not affect you in the future. It will. Look at verse 8 of chapter 12. It says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. This is the last words we hear from the preacher. The end of the book is another voice who's going to tie everything that he said all together. Do you remember the first thing that the preacher said to us? The very first words that we heard from Koheleth was meaningless. Meaningless. It is the thesis of his entire book. Meaningless. So he begins saying meaningless and he ends saying meaningless. And when we first heard those words, meaningless, months ago, and hearing those words now, we were different people. Because we've listened to the teacher talk about why he believes everything is meaningless. And, and don't forget that meaningless, the Hebrew word hebel, is not mean literally meaningless. It means a mist or breath. When I give my kids SpaghettiOs and it's really, really hot, the steam is coming up, and they say, Daddy, blow it, out, blow it off for me, and I blow off that steam. That steam is Hebel. That steam is what life is like. It's there, you see it, and you reach out to grab it, and as you reach out to grab it, it's gone. Life, everything is fleeting. So if everything in this life is fleeting, how then should we live? That is what he's been trying to nail into our heads for the last 11 chapters. And in the end, he's going to, well, not him, but the editor, whoever it is, is going to put it all together for us and help us look at the entire book of Ecclesiastes. And we'll see that the next message. Let me just end by saying there are so many things that I, I, I could say about our time with the preacher I've enjoyed the preacher. He's been a great teacher. And the thing that I think <laughs> when we first started and I said, turn to Ecclesiastes, we're going to be in this book. People said, oh, really? People came to me and said, oh, this is going to be a depressing book, huh? And more than one person has come to me and said, Ecclesiastes was at the bottom of my favorite books of the Bible. And it has become one of my favorite books. And I think the reason is because it is so applicable to what we're dealing with right now. Because sometimes you just turn on the TV, you're just like, why? What is going on? Someone sent me a video of, it actually got deleted before it went up, of a, a woman on a plane who pretended like she had a baby. It was a cat. Why? There are people who are doing things you just think, what is, what is going on in this world? Why are people taking trucks and driving them through parades? Why do people take guns to school and shoot people? Everything in this life, when you really start to see, you say, yes, it's meaningless. 
and you start to say, if I'm trying to search for meaning under the sun, you're never going to find it. But what is he going to say at the end? Look above the sun. Remember your creator. And here's what I want to encourage you with. Even if you don't remember your creator, your creator remembers you. He remembers you. I think one of my most, the most interesting story in the Bible, remember Jesus is on the cross and there are two thieves next to him. Can you imagine? This is like, I don't believe in luck, but this is really lucky. You're dying and you're next to Jesus on the cross as he's paying for the sins of the world. And before, at some point, both thieves are mocking him or making fun of him, saying all kinds of stuff to him. And at some point, one of the thieves, the Holy Spirit got a hold of his heart, and he looked at Jesus and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, what, what does that mean? Remember, we talk about remember. He doesn't mean, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, be like, oh, that thief, he was there. No, I want you to think of me with regard to me. And you know what Jesus said to him? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Jesus listens to the cry of every sinner who says, remember me. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.